Hey everyone, this is Ryan here, and welcome to our prosthodontic series. Like all my videos, I'm going to be focusing only on the highest yield things you need to know for the board exam. And now that we've covered the big general concepts of prosthodontics, we're going to start to talk more about removable prosthodontics, and particularly getting accustomed to a dentulous anatomy. So we're going to start in this video by talking about maxillary edentulous anatomy. And you'll first notice that with this picture, there are no teeth here. And of course, that's the definition of fully edentulous. And so we'll label this structure here that starts posterior and wraps to the anterior and back to the posterior as the alveolar ridge. And it's one of the two jaw ridges that are either extensions of the mandible or the maxilla in this case. So next I wanna talk about the frenal attachments which is sometimes called the frenum or the frenulum, and they're thin folds of mucous membrane with enclosed muscle fibers that restrict or secure movement of mobile tissue. So we can find those structures in this image here. And the, the labial frenum is typically right at or just adjacent to the midline of the patient. So here we can see the labial frenum right about at the midline. And so that, again, is a fold of mucous membrane tissue that is restricting or securing movement of the mobile tissue. So for the labial frenum, that would be the labial mucosa and the lips. Now, buccal frenum, buccal referring to the cheeks, are on either side of the alveolar ridge. And you might be able to see them. They're a little bit more faint, but here we can see uh, the right buccal frenum for this patient, and the left buccal frenum appears to be a bit more anterior. They're not always symmetric like this. And so the buccal frenum, again, are restricting or securing movement for this uh, buccal mucosa. So those are the frenum. Now the frenum are not only important functionally, but also important boundary markers. Since the area between the frenum represent different regions of the vestibule. So the vestibule is the space or area between the lips and the ridge or between the cheeks and the ridge. And so the labial vestibule goes from buccal frenum to buccal frenum. So all this space between the lips and the alveolar ridge is referred to as the labial vestibule. Now the buccal vestibule is this space that's posterior to the buccal frenum on either side. So the buccal vestibule will go from the buccal frenum and it will go back to a posterior boundary marker called the hamular notch. So the hamular notch is a notch or fissure formed at the junction of the maxilla and the hamular process of the sphenoid bone and it's just distal just beyond the distal end of the alveolar process or alveolar ridge. So I put up this image of a skull so you could appreciate how the hamular notch would be uh, this soft tissue that connects the distal end of the maxilla and the pterygoid hamulus or just the hamulus. And so this tissue here that connects these two structures would translate to this tissue here. So here we have the hamular notch, which you can really appreciate on the right side, and the hamular notch on the patient's left side is a bit cut off in this image. Also in this image, you can really appreciate the buccal vestibule, because the buccal frenum is super prominent in this patient, and you can really see the space that goes posterior to it and stops at the hamular notch. So this would be the buccal vestibule on this side of the patient. And here it is on the other side. So next, we have a very important structure that's uh, unique to the maxilla, and that is the vibrating line. And uh, it generally runs from hamular notch to hamular notch. So it would run right along this line, let's say. Now it's usually two millimeters away from the fovea palatini, which are two little pits in the palate. Uh, they're hard to see in this image, 
Some patients, they're easier to see than others. Now, the problem is some studies say that the fovea palatini are two millimeters in front of the vibrating line, while other studies say they're two millimeters behind the vibrating line. And the only way to really make sure you know where the vibrating line is in a patient is to make them say, ah. So when you go to the doctor and they ask you to say, ah, and they put a tongue depressor on your tongue, that is essentially the idea. And this area will be where the vibrating tissue ends. So there'll be a certain point where the soft tissue is vibrating and there'll be a line that everything anterior to that line will not be vibrating. And so that's where you know where exactly the vibrating line would be for that patient. And so you can mark it with an indelible ink marker that would eventually wipe off. And again, that's how you get the name vibrating line, because that's really the only way to make sure you can locate it in a particular patient. Now, the next line that I think is important, I call the butterfly line. This is a made up term. That's why it's in quotations, but it kind of looks like the wings of a butterfly. And you can see it clinically in patients with the color change between hard palette and soft palette. So I'm going to go back to this image because I think you can see it a little bit better. The butterfly line would be these two arches here. You can see the, the clear demarcation between soft palette and hard palette, and the butterfly line would go like this. And the vibrating line would be a bit posterior to that. And that's super important to remember. So the butterfly line would be like here. Let me draw it with a pen so I can really clarify this point. So the butterfly line would be right about here and come around like that. And let's just say the vibrating line would go from hamular notch to hamular notch. So maybe something like that. And so we have this really important area here that we'll talk about next. But the um, again, like with the vibrating line, we can go by... Um, just clinical features, but there is a particular thing you can do with the patient to make sure that you locate the butterfly line properly. And that's um, doing something called the Valsalva maneuver. So when you perform the Valsalva maneuver, basically hold your nose with your fingers and gently try to push air through the nose, and it would kind of balloon your soft palate down. So the butterfly line is essentially the junction between the hard palate and the soft palate, which we're able to tell pretty easily in this picture just due to the color change between the two structures. So both of these lines together form a critical, critical component of the complete upper denture, which is called the posterior palatal seal area. So the posterior palatal seal is an area of the denture that sufficiently compresses the soft tissue of the palate so the denture can become like a suction cup to the upper arch and have a thin film layer of undisturbed saliva that doesn't leak out the back because we have a nice seal on the palate in this area that's located between the butterfly line, which is the anterior boundary of the posterior palatal seal, and the vibrating line, which is the posterior boundary of the posterior palatal seal. Now, you can tell in this patient it's a lot less um, evident where that butterfly line would be, so that's when you'd really have to rely on the Valsalva maneuver to locate it. So for vibrating line, we could say maybe it's something like this, and the butterfly line, again, I can't really make it out too much, but we'll say it goes something like this. And so that, that would be a pretty massive posterior palatal seal area, but just to give you an idea, that is what the region would sort of look like. So again, just to review, the butterfly line is the anterior boundary of the posterior palatal seal. You can tell where it is by doing the Valsalva maneuver, and it's the junction of the hard and soft palate. The vibrating line is the posterior boundary of the posterior palatal seal, and you can make sure you know where it is by having the, by pa having the patient say, ah, and it would be from hamular notch to hamular notch. Now the master cast, when you're doing your lab work, 
is slightly carved around the area of the by reading line to create more acrylic thickness to make up for polymerization shrinkage and cooling shrinkage of the denture material so that the denture is slightly thicker and would compress the palette to create an ideal posterior palatal seal. And we'll talk more about acrylic thickness and uh, polymerization shrinkage when we talk about denture materials. All right, so next we have the coronoid notch. And this uh, is not really describing the anatomy of the patient, but rather the distobuccal area of the impression or of the denture. So it refers to the distobuccal area on the impression or the denture for the upper arch. And so this impression is made usually with um, a customized edentulous tray and some PVS material, which is um, the stuff we talked about in the last video. And you would do what's called border molding, where you have the patient move their lips and stick their tongue out and they swallow, basically put their facial muscles through everyday movements so that you can capture with the impression in place where the borders of the denture should go. And you want the borders of the denture to be deep enough to get a good seal, but you don't want them to be too deep so that they're impinging on the patient's soft tissue and irritating them. So for the coronoid notch area, that would be I have a very thin line here, but I'll, I will make it a little bit thicker so you can appreciate it. This would be um, the coronoid notch on that side, and this would be the coronoid notch on this side of the impression. And the final denture would match that contour. And so for the coronoid notch area, you'd have the patient move in lateral excursion, right and left. So they move their mandible from side to side during this border molding process, so that the anterior portion of the coronoid process contours the distobuccal flange of the impression, so that this same process will glide past the distobuccal corners of the denture and not interfere with it, not knock into it, and then that would displace the denture. So you want to make sure that flattened area is present when you're doing the impression. And lastly, we have the pterygomandibular raffe, which connects the buccinator muscle and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle. So the pterygomandibular raffe is this uh, band of fibrous tissue right here, and it connects to the buccinator anteriorly and the superior pharyngeal constrictor posteriorly. And so going back to border molding, we would want to tell the patient to open their mouth wide, and that would mold the impression material in the very back of the impression, because the pterygomandibular raffe would move forward as the patient um, opens wide, and so you want to make sure that the posterior portion of the denture is properly molded, and so again, that if the patient is opening wide with their dentures in place, that they're not dislodging them. So you want to make sure it's extended properly. So to review, the two most important movements for upper impression are to move the mandible left and right, and that's so the coronoid process will glide past the distobuccal corners of the denture, and to open the mouth wide so that the pterygomandibular raffe tightens and molds the impression material in the back. So the big thing to remember for the coronoid notch is that it's the distobuccal area of the impression in the denture, and that the pterygomandibular raffe is connecting to these two muscles and is located um, or is important for the posterior border molding of the upper arch. All right, so that was a lot of terms. I know hopefully I was able to sort of boil it down to the most important concepts that you need to know for maxillary edentulous anatomy and impressing that anatomy when going to make a denture for it. So in the next video, we'll do the same thing, but we'll talk about the mandibular edentulous anatomy. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you in the next one.